Yeah, I, I think we're we're good to go. Okay, I'm just going to do a little quick uh, mention of Jenny. She's a wildlife conservationist for the Department of Energy and Environment Protection, and she's been one for over 10 years. I'm telling you, Jenny is very knowledgeable. Um, she lives near a, a forest or in a forest, and she uh, has a passion for all things natural. And with that, Jenny, I'm just going to start and let you take over. And Jenny's going to be here. And once she starts talking and has her show, she her picture will disappear. And then she'll come back for all of you to answer your questions at the end. Okay, thank you. I figure you don't need my talking head. I've got some beautiful photos of animals. Uh, again, I just want to uh, congratulate Sharon and Matthew. I love to see when... Uh, Towns get together with different entities and um, educate people about different things. And I can't say enough about land trusts or friends groups. Uh, volunteer if you can. If you can't volunteer, try to help them financially because they are protecting our envir environment for future generations. So uh, anyway, here we go. Uh, we'll talk about Fox and I'll be happy to answer questions at the end. Foxes are small members of the Canidae family. They're related to wolves, coyotes, and jackals. They live on every continent except Antarctica. There are, total, there are a total of 47 different subspecies of foxes in the world. Like a cat, the fox is most active after the sun goes down, although that doesn't mean you won't see it in the day. Uh, hold on, I got to X out some of this across the screen. Um, it has vertically oriented pupils, as you can see there, so it can see in dim light, and it hunts by stalking and pouncing prey. It also has very sensitive cat-like whiskers, you can see that on the red fox there, and spines on its tongue. Remember how sticky cat tongues are, well fox tongues are like that too. It can walk on its toes, which helps it be quiet and stealthy, and it also accounts for its more elegant feline-like tracks. Uh, the gray fox, which we do have here in Connecticut, even has retractable claws that make it easier for it to uh, climb trees. It's the only member of the dog family that can climb trees. Although I have seen some hounds down in the south almost get up a tree when they were going after something. But anyway, unlike their canid relatives, fox are not pack animals. When raising their young, they live in small families called a leash of foxes or a skulk of foxes in underground burrows, sometimes in caves, and sometimes under your shed. Otherwise, they hunt and sleep alone. Uh, wild red foxes generally live up to around nine years, but in an area like Connecticut, which is the fourth most fragmented state, uh, state in the country, which means a lot of roads and buildings, uh, they oftentimes get hit by cars a lot. Uh, uh, so their average, uh, um, age where they'll live might be between three and five years. Uh, the most common cause of fox deaths is road accidents, particularly for males and younger animals as they start exploring and disperse from a breeding site from August to December, although they are very susceptible to mange and other diseases. Uh, although they're, they're wild, their relationship with people does go way back. Uh, in 2011, research opened a grave in 16,500-year-old Jordan Cemetery, and they found the remains of a man and his pet fox. This was 4,000 years before the first known human and domestic dog were buried together. So that was quite an amazing find. Only six types of fox live in North America. Today, we will talk about the red fox and gray fox uh, more, uh, but we'll also mention a little about the Arctic fox the kit fox, the island fox, and the swift fox. Island foxes uh, are very interesting, and I'll tell you their uh, kind of unique history. Uh, the American red fox, this photo on the top right is by Paul Fusco. He used to be the deep photographer, but he retired, a very good photographer. Um, it's the biggest fox in North America. It also has the largest range. Uh, uh, they're found in every U.S. state. Uh, scientists have long debated whether the red fox is native to North America or only here because it was introduced by Europeans who brought it here because they wanted to have fox hunts. Nevertheless, they're here to stay and they're thriving. Uh, the red fox uh, population across the globe is about 
357,000 hasn't changed very much in the last decade. The gray fox uh, was a member of the Canada family also. It inhabits North and Central America. It once had very prolific numbers, but they are dwindling because of human habitation and deforestation. Scientists believe the gray fox has been in North America for 3.6 million years. Pretty amazing. Um, it is a close genetic relative to the raccoon dog and the bat-eared fox. Gray foxes are the only canid with ranges throughout both North and South America. You can find them everywhere in the southern half of North America. They do prefer wooded rocky regions and bluffs and range from southern Canada to Venezuela and Colombia. However, they do not inhabit the <clears throat> northwest mountainous areas of the United States. The kit fox, the one with the large ears down on the bottom left there, Likes warm weather, inhabits the arid regions of the southwestern United States and Mexico. Also, the northern edge of their ter territory is eastern Oregon, and the east border is uh, southern Colorado. So they do live and thrive in the states of Nevada, Utah, California, Arizona, Texas, and New Mexico. They're very small members of the canid family. And they are usually only three to six pounds and 17 to 21 inches long. So very small. Uh, this is an adult that you're looking at there. The biggest part about a fox, kit fox, is its ears. They're four inches long and they help dissipate heat, surprisingly enough. Uh, their coats tend to be yellowish gray. Uh, each hair will be individual covers, which gives them kind of that brindled appearance. Um, they have long hair on the bottom of their feet that protects them from the hot sand. Uh, they have a bushy gray tail. Most, most fox do have bushy tails, and it has a black tip, and it also has those unique black patches of fur around its nose. The Arctic fox is very beautiful. It does change colors in the winter. It's called the white fox, the snow fox, and polar fox because of its white fur that it does obtain when uh, the winter comes. It is native to Arctic regions and is well suited to living in the cold. Uh, it resides from coastal areas of Alaska to the eastern border of Canada, so they, they are up in Quebec. Uh, its fur is thick and the white color is excellent camouflage against the snow and ice. They're about 22 to 27 inches long, so not really real big. They're kind of more rounded than other foxes and that helps minimize the loss of body heat. They weigh between seven and 20 pounds, so they can get up there and be pretty heavy. Uh, they uh, have several adaptations to help them survive in the cold. One thing I like about animals, all the animals, is a lot of animals, they all have these remarkable adaptations that we don't tend to have to help them survive in, in the worlds in which they live. So the Arctic fox can regulate their metabolism to conserve fat. They can increase their fur thickness by 140% in the winter. Imagine that. Uh, their body temperature they can increase using heat exchange with blood in their legs to keep their feet from freezing. Uh, to me, these are pretty impressive adaptation considering they are standing on an ice cube much of the time. Uh, they have terrific hearing and can sense lemmings burrowing under the snow and ice. They also, like other foxes, have a great sense of smell. Uh, they can sniff lemmings out 30 inches of, with under 30 inches of snow and smell a carcass from, listen to this, this is even better than a black bear, from 24 miles away. Now, I always wonder how scientists figure this stuff out, but I'm sure they have all these formulas. And when I try to read those scientific journals, there's all those lesser and greater than symbols and infinity symbols with numbers, and it gets me all mixed up. So anyway, uh, I just listen to what they tell me and believe it. Uh, the Arctic fox, uh, as I said, does live in the northernmost part of the hemisphere. Uh, they do handle cold better than most animals. They do not start shivering, and shivering helps us kind of fend off the cold until temps reach nine, uh, minus 70 degrees. Not only does the fox's six fur hold in heat, it can wrap its tail around its body like a blanket to keep warm. Other foxes do this as well. Even squirrels do this. In autumn, they build up the fat, which does increase their body weight by half. Uh, and that gives them insulation and helps the fox survive the coldest days of winter. Their numbers are declining. And one of the reasons is the red fox, because 
as uh, the tundra starts melting, the red fox is moving in there uh, competing for prey. Uh, red foxes are superior hunters, and uh, they also eat Arctic foxes. So none of this bodes well for the Arctic fox's future. Uh, many foxes, some can run up to 42 miles per hour. Uh, it gives a new meaning to quick like a fox. They're very agile. They'll be able to jump some three feet, some more in the air and climb fences and over roofs. So you can find them almost anywhere. One Arctic fox walked 2,700 miles from Norway to Canada in three months. That's over 30 miles a day. Pretty impressive. Uh, again, foxes are famous for those big bushy tails, which isn't, as I said, just for beauty. It does keep them warm in winter and as a communication device. They have ovular shaped eyes, which are different from those of other can canids with round eyes. Uh, they have those cat-like whiskers again. You can see them in those pictures. Uh, they don't howl like other dogs, not exactly. They have shrill barking, chattering, and whine whining sounds. And you will hear some of those later. Uh, the historical range of the swift fox includes the entire Great Plains region. And that's an area where there's not a lot of bobcat and other type of predatory animals because farmers just don't want them there. Um, the swift fox could be found from Alberta to Texas, from Minnesota and Iowa to New Mexico and Mon Montana in its uh, 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 traditional range. But today, the range of it is dwindling and limited to the western edge of its historic range. It's estimated that they can be found in only 44% of their historic range. Um, there are a few populations of them in South Central Canada and the Central and Southwest United States. It's the smallest wild canine living in North America. It's three, it can be three to seven pounds when it's adult. It re reaches lengths of 27 to 32 inches from head to tail. It's about half the size of a red fox. The colors can vary with the seasons. <clears throat> it can be gray, grayish tan on the back. It does have some of that orange that the red fox has. Uh, in the summer, it's more red tan color, help it camouflage. And again, it has a long bushy tail. Uh, the, uh, and then the island fox, uh, and I meant to say before, I'm sorry, that swift foxes uh, are pretty much prairie foxes. Uh, they often uh, used to uh, consume prairie dogs, and the population of prairie dogs are dwindling, so that is having an effect on the swift foxes as well. Uh, so the island fox only lives on six of the eight channel islands off the coast of Southern California. They're found nowhere else on Earth, so they are very unique. Uh, each island population is recognized as a separate endemic or unique subspecies of the island fox. It is the descendant, as you can look at it now, of the mainland gray fox, and it's the largest of the Ch uh, Channel Islands native mammals, which is pretty interesting, uh, but one of the smallest canid species in the world. Um, you know, foxes have always existed in fair, some low population sizes, uh, these these four island fox subspecies underwent catastrophic I'm sorry I have trouble with that word catastrophic declines in the 1990s um, on San Miguel Santa Rosa and Santa Cruz Islands uh, in the Channel Islands National Park the decline was attributed to predation by golden eagles uh, the presence of uh, non -native, native ungulates as a food source for the eagles. Uh, brought them there, and also the, the the growth of bald eagles and also other animals once DDT was banned has given uh, the, the eagles a clear hunting time for this poor island fox. Um, by 2000, predation on island foxes resulted in population declines to 15 individuals on San Miguel and Santa Rosa Islands and less than 80 on the Santa Cruz Islands. So they are federally listed as an endangered species. Uh, it is the only carnivore unique to California. Uh, and although it's one of the smallest canids in the world, it is the largest native terrestrial mammal on the Channel Islands. Uh, it's one third smaller than the gray fox. And um, it can be long lived. Some individuals have been known to live 15 years, but they're not competing with a lot of human traffic, I can say. So going on to foxes in general, indigenous and First Nations peoples 
have a long-standing respect for the natural world as they heavily depended on their environment for survival, and many still do. Uh, one way that they connect to and pay respect to nature is through spirit and totem animals. In Native American folklore, foxes appear in a variety of capacities. Often, fox is a trickster companion to the coyote. Uh, in some myths, foxes are wise and benevolent. In others, they are connected to the fire and the sun. But like coyotes, they do play a variety of roles in Native American mythology from different tribes. Some Southwestern tribes and many tribes of Mexico say that the fox is the ir irreverent trickster character uh, more often portrayed by coyotes in North American folklore. In some Northern California tribes, what they call the silver fox is a wise and benevolent creator god. Other tribes, uh, such as Blackfoot and the Apaches, it's associated with the fire and the sun, very powerful um, uh, symbols. It was fox who stole fire to bring to the people. In some other Native American cultures, it was coyote who did that. Uh, the Arapahoes associate, associate the kid fox with the sacred pipe. Um, so many as you, many of these places have different uh, functions for foxes. They are common clan animals in many Native American cultures. Uh, fox uh, tribes with fox clans include the Cree, the Minomini, and the Hopi. In the Hopi tribe, fox skins are used as a dance regalia by Kachina dancers uh, and as adornments and other ceremonies. Uh, as a lot of um, Native American cultures would use a full animal like this fox on the left for their quivers, for their arrows. And sometimes the mouth of, they would drape the legs of the animal over their uh, necks to hold the quiver on. And oftentimes they would close the mouth of the animal and place clay in there that would hold the ar arrows. And then they sometimes would put poison in the clay and that would be a way they would poison their arrows. In Western culture, foxes have long been called wily, clever, and cunning. It's not a compliment. These foxes were portrayed as deceptive tricksters only out for themselves. Uh, this attitude may reflect the fox's adaptability, their nocturnal habits, and tenacious ability to get into a hen house or evade hunting dogs. Um, they still outwit humans on a regular basis. Uh, uh, there was one uh, Arctic fox that played dead to escape Siberian fur trappers, uh, proving itself to be one sly fox. Um, as you know, I always like to look at literature and history. Foxes appear throughout folklore. Uh, examples include a nine-tailed fox from various Asian cultures, the Reynard tales from medieval um, Europe, and Reynard the fox has been made into kids' books, and most ch uh, children may have read about it. Uh, the sly trickster fox from the Native American lore and Aesop's The Fox and the Crow. Uh, the Finnish lore says that the fox made the northern lights by running in the snow so that its tail swept sparks into the sky. So in this, we get the phrase Foxfire or Firefox, uh, like the Mozilla internet browser. So pretty interesting. Uh, Rainer the Fox is the epic fable in which the characters are animals, the fox being the hero. And it was very popular during the Middle Ages. So that's a very long lived uh, folklore. It relates the adventures of the fox at the court of the king of the beasts, the lion, and details with much spirit and humor the cunning modes in which the fox contrives to outwit his enemies and gain favor of the queen, king, sorry. Uh, and everybody, all of us must know Fox, uh, Dr. Seuss's Fox and Socks. And by the way, there is a Dr. Seuss Museum in Springfield. It's pretty, pretty cool. What happens when a fox and socks meets Mr. Knox in a box? All the vaguely nonsensical rhyming fun that makes Seuss's book still popular today. And this was a very popular book of his. The cover warns, this fox is a tricky fox. He'll try to get your tongue in trouble. Or The Fox and the Hound, very famous. Uh, it was a book that Disney made into a film. And young, young Todd, the famous line, asked young Copper, who will become a hunting dog, uh, we'll always be for friends forever, won't we? And, yet, and Copper says, yeah, forever, even though he's training to be a hunting dog. Uh, so in order to realistically portray the fox, 
the author of that book, Daniel Mannix, spent many more than a year studying wild foxes as well as a mated pair he kept at his home. Uh, so a lot of authors who write about animals do observe their animal behavior, and that's how they come up with uh, the actions of the animals. Uh, so another famous, one of my favorite books is The Little Prince, and one of the most famous passages in it um, is The Little Prince is sad. He's left his planet in the rose he cared for, and now on Earth he is devastated to find there are a thousand of roses when he thought his was unique. This is quoting, um, he meets a strange pretty animal that greets him from under an apple tree. It is a fox. The little prince asks the fox to play with him. The fox tells him, I cannot play with you because I have not been tame. The little prince then says, does not know the meaning of that word tame. He has to ask three times before the fox tells him that to be tamed is to establish ties. So the little prince goes on to ask him how that's done. And in this way, the fox is eventually tamed and able to reveal the secret of life. It's a very wonderful book. I encourage you to read it if you have not. I had to read it in French class. <laughs> but anyway, um, so uh, we Mike asked us the question. We do not have the fox, but you can see this is kind of a scale of uh, different animals in the canid family. Uh, the gray uh, fox is a smaller fox. Uh, it does, it's not like the big foxes can be up to 120 pounds, but the gray fox is a smaller fox and a little smaller than a red fox. Uh, then you see the red fox uh, there and the coyote. We're going from the bottom uh, up. Sorry about that. Uh, and then the coyote can be up to 40 pounds, sometimes 50. And uh, then the gray wolf uh, can go up to, I've heard mostly 120, but there have been some reports that it's longer. So quite a difference in size. They're kind of unmistakable when, when you see them. Um, so here we come to our, our Connecticut fox species. We're lucky to have two species, the more well-known and populous red fox and the gray fox. Um, I'm very happy that this young photographer, he's not even 20 years old, he lives out in uh, California and rarely uh, takes photos out at the national parks there. He has befriended me and he lets me use his photos. So uh, I'm very grateful for that uh, and because he takes spectacular photos. Um, both of the gray and red fox are members, as I said, of the canine family and both especially the gray or as I said, kind of cat-like canines uh, with the vertical eyes, contracting pupils and gray's ability to climb trees. Um, while the two species are quite distinct from each other to the casual observer, they can appear rather similar because individual gray foxes can have a fair amount of red coloration. Uh, all, most animals' fur is distinctive to itself, even though it has, you know, similarities like mostly red on the red fox. Um, but the, the gray foxes can get a little more red creeping up on their gray. And, you know, if it's not good light out, you can mistake them, although they are generally fairly smaller. Uh, red foxes are generally red. Uh, they have black legs that look like they're dipped in um, paint and generally have a white tip on their tail and a white neck. But again, I've seen uh, red foxes that do not have a white tip on their tail. Uh, gray fox typ typically have a black tip on their tail. Uh, the gray fox is the smaller of the two, rarely exceeds 12 pounds uh, and often weighs much less. Uh, they like woodland edges and open fields, but also the forest because they do climb trees to sleep in there and they will steal, nest, uh, steal eggs and young uh, nestlings sometimes. Uh, red foxes are animals of the woodland edges and fields, but they also thrive in woodlands. Uh, they're known to reach weights of up to 15 pounds, and they're up to three weight, uh, sorry, three feet in length, uh, with about a foot and a half more for their tails. So, uh, the gray foxes are the shyer of the two; they're less often seen. Red foxes are sometimes brazen and somewhat disarming when the presence of humans, who do not expect a wild animal to be so curious or to hang around. But if you wave your arms and make noise, they generally run away. Both of these foxes do share the ability to thrive in forests and fields. They eat a variety of foods from nuts, fruits, berries, to small mammals, birds, frogs, turtles, even insects. 
their adaptability does make them well suited to survive in urban and suburban areas. Uh, and they are helpful to homeowners there because they like to eat rodents. They keep that population down. They're primarily nocturnal in urban areas, but uh, it's more to avoid humans than an actual preference. Uh, it's a misconception that if you see a fox during the daytime, it's disturbed or sick. That's not uh, that's not mostly the case. It, it will be the case sometimes. Um, they'll be active during the day if they feel secure and near enough safety or cover. Uh, that's when they'll pursue prey like squirrels that are under your bird feeders who are active during the day. I've seen many a fox trot off with a squirrel tail wagging while it has it in its mouth. Uh, the two species, again, are quite distinct from each other, but again, they could be similar. Um, one way to tell them apart, again, are those um, that the fox has those black legs. You can see up on the top right, my friend Cheryl Anderson, uh, let me use these photos, of the top two photos. Um, and they usually have the white tip, although that one doesn't on their tail. Again, the uh, gray fox usually has a black tip tail. And of course, if it's in a tree, then it's a gray fox. The red fox do not climb trees. Uh, foxes are excellent hunters. They'll use their sense of smell and sight and their incredible speed and pouncing ability to catch prey. They're very agile. They can hear a small sound of a small animal digging about 150 yards away. They tend to be solitary, usually hunting alone, except when they have the family unit. It is not unusual, again, to see them in the daytime. Um, they're important predators of prolific prey species, as I said, like mice, rats, and rabbits. Uh, they have few predators uh, other than humans, <clears throat> although coyotes likely will not tolerate foxes within their territories. Mostly fox territories occur within the gaps between the larger coyote territories. The relatively recent expansion of coyotes in Connecticut have displaced foxes somewhat from their prime habitats, so they've had to adjust. Both the gray and fox are omnivores, which means they eat plant and animal matter. Again, they're opportunistic feeders, so they'll take whatever comes along. Uh, if there's not a, the available sources of food they like, they will eat carrion or dead stuff. Um, they also will cache their excess food. So if they're full, uh, they'll cache their excess food after hunting and foraging, and uh, they'll return sometimes to these storage sites, uh, dig them up, inspect it, and then rebury it somewhere else. Imagine how rancid that must be uh, so it won't be detected by other animals. Uh, they are very vocal and have a large repertoire of howls, barks, and whines. Uh, if you Google uh, scream in the night, you'll often see about 20 videos of a man, sorry guys, looking outside in the dark, pointing, saying, hear that? That's a fisher cat. Well, first of all, it's not a fisher cat, it's a fisher, it's a weasel. And secondly, they mostly only growl. So most of those wild piercing screams in the night are generally red fox, which has about 40 different types of vocalizations. Um, Anyway, uh, the fox usually are shy and wary, but as I said, they are very curious. Uh, their activity is variable. Uh, they do not hibernate in the winter. Uh, they maintain territories that will vary in size from two to seven square miles. We're noticing with our animals now that territories seem to be changing a little, whether that's a reflection of climate change or food availability or, or in the fox uh, in the sense of the fox, maybe more coyotes. It's uh, something the biologists are studying and uh, will determine one of these days. Um, territories are shared by mated pairs and their immature pups, but are actively defended from non-related foxes. Uh, like a guided missile, though, the fox, when he goes out to hunt, harnesses Earth's magnetic field uh, other animals like birds, sharks, and turtles have this magnetic sense, but the fox is the first one known to use it to catch prey. And according to an article in New Scientist mag mag magazine, the fox can see the planet's magnetic field as a ring of shadow on its eyes. It darkens as it moves towards magnetic north. When the shadow and the sound of prey lines up, it's time to pounce. So again, a pretty remarkable adaptation to help these animals exist. 
<clears throat> so mammals, including humans and foxes, smell airborne substances when molecules enter their nose and bind to receptors in our nasal cavity. Uh, me around Christmas, those red candles just do nuts on my sense of smell. But anyway, the receptors send a signal to the brain's olfactory cortex, leading to the sensation of smell. Again, as I said, foxes do have an acute sense of smell. Uh, they rely on scents to communicate each other, to find food, to avoid predators, and locate breeding partners, and to mark territory. So they do mark a lot. They go along and they will uh, pee and leave their scents from their anal glands, like all over the place. And if you're experienced at tracking, you can really smell it. It does smell sort of skunk-like, so it is a pretty strong smell. Uh, they can deposit messages sent marks to be read after the marker has left. This is useful for claiming and defending their territory. The, they do have two glands that they emit these scents from, a patch on the tail known as the violet gland uh, because of its floral odor, uh, and uh, a pair of sacs on either side of their anus, which can release that skunk-like smell. Uh, fox scents are also present in their urine, so um, not just when they're marking. Um, here are tracks, uh, wild animals as they go along, if they're not chasing something, they kind of tend to go in a straight line. Uh, you can see over here, not to scale because a wolf's, uh, a wolf's uh, paw would be about the shape of, well, my hand, so it could be like five inches uh, long, as you see there, whereas a coyote would be about three inches long. A lot of times the coyote track looks a little more um, narrow. Uh, canids do show their claws. Uh, a lot of times uh, coyote tracks, uh, dog tracks are mistaken for coyotes. Uh, but red fox tracks are small and kind of pointy as they hit. This is the best time of year if we ever get any snow to see tracks. So I encourage you to go out if we finally get some uh, because that's the best way to see a track. Although once the snow starts melting, it enlarges the track and makes it harder to see. These are the few photos I have to show you how relations animals have to other animals. Uh, this fox is not going after this raccoon. A lot of times animals choose their, their prey. They don't want to get hurt. Uh, raccoons have nasty teeth and uh, claws, and they also travel in groups sometimes. So that fox moved on. Here's Here again, here's a little fox just wondering what this bear's doing right now. Uh, and actually it was sniffing another bear scat so that had berries in it. So uh, anyway, the fox decided to move along. Not that that black bear would go after that fox, although uh, black bears sometimes in the spring, if they come up on uh, a young uh, animal of any kind, they might eat them. Uh, both species of fox breed in mid to late February. So now you'll hear a lot of those uh, mating calls and uh, they start preparing their dens at this time. Uh, a den is typically a burrow, one that they've usually taken from some, some other animal that, that digs burrows like a woodchuck or uh, some other animal. Uh, it's usually 50 to 20 feet long. So they dig it deeper and usually located, you know, uh, on the side of a hill uh, but they also could set up dens under your outbuildings or in rock crevices or in the case of the gray, uh, uh, gray um, fox, even in trees. Uh, oftentimes, the dens have several entrances. Uh, sometimes they will have to dig their own dens. But again, more often than not, they'll take them from burrowing animals such as woodchucks and skunks. <clears throat> That's a little gray fox on the top left and a gray fox on the right. And down to the left, you see a young red fox following mom who has a bowl in its mouth and uh, then two young red foxes. Uh, the single annual litter for the foxes is born after a gestation period of from 51 to 53 days for both species. Uh, four kits are common. Most foxes have more than one den and they'll move their kits if they are disturbed or if they feel dangers nearby. The young will stay in the den Till they're about four to five weeks old, and at which time they emerge and begin to play outside the entrance. Uh, both adults with the fox and the coyotes care for their young by bringing food and guarding the site. Uh, the young are weaned at 12 weeks and join the adults on hunting farways and they learn to catch food on their own. I've seen a fox get a mouse, uh, like an adult fox, and 
play with it, bat it around, just like you've probably seen your domestic cats, you know, and then toss it over to the, the young fox and they start trying to learn to do the same. The young disperse in the fall from the family and usually breed during their first winter. Uh, the mother fox is called a vixen, uh, as I said, does wean them around three months. Uh, and uh, they are known to play among themselves as well as with other animals. I've seen them uh, even, you know, playing with dog like dogs. So, uh, but play also in the fox world establishes social hierarchy and it starts very young. Uh, as soon as the pups can walk, they start fighting with each other. It can be brutal, even fatal. Uh, one in five pups never make it out of the den. So it's pretty vicious. Uh, unlike coyotes, they, their young will do the same thing, but generally speaking, don't hurt each other. But they do establish hierarchy within the uh, uh, offspring oftentimes. And it's not always the largest, you know, one or a male. Uh, it's just the one that has the most fight in it, I guess. Uh, the fox can be found hunting in the day or night. As I said, it's under cover of darkness where they're most lethal. Uh, they have well-developed senses of sight, hearing, touch, and smell, and they use all of these senses to hunt. They can turn their ears, actually, which helps them locate prey by sound. Like many other predators, uh, including humans, they have binocular vision, uh, both eyes facing forward, and because each eye sees the same scene slightly differently, uh, this binocular vision allows their brain to calculate distance. Uh, their ears are very sensitive to low frequencies, and that helps them hear those burrowing animals underground. If it does hear an animal underground, a fox can dip it, dig it up and catch it in a matter of seconds. Fox mate, as I said, 40 different sounds. The most startling, though, might be its scream, often heard in the middle of the night during the animal's mating season. Uh, before uh, Hollywood had moved synthesizers and enhanced um, ways to make noise and, and stuff, they would use, record animal sounds and magnify those and use those for all the scary movies. And back before social media, there were these clubs and the people couldn't wait for the next scary movie to figure out which animal sound they were using. So quite uh, fascinating, really. I'm told they still have those groups, but I don't know how they function now that everything can be done uh, electronically. Or, uh, the most commonly heard red fox vocalizations are a quick series of barks and a screamy variation on a howl, which you'll hear in a minute. All of these vocalizations are higher pitched than dogs, uh, partly because fox are much smaller. Uh, their barks are sort of uh, very high pitched, almost yippy. Um, their screamy howl is most often heard, as I said, during breeding season. So leave a crack in your windows, but probably not this weekend. It's going to be pretty cold. So uh, the baby fox has a distress call. Uh, it's it's shrill, hoarse scream of anguish. It sounds more than anything like a human baby undergoing some kind of uh, physical torture. Sometimes police stations are called and said that a baby's being tortured outside or somebody's being killed. Uh, this call, which the female also uses, is used to lure male foxes to them for mating, uh, though males have been found to make this sound occasionally. Uh, their bark and scream are very loud and often carry for miles, um, but other fox vocalizations are quiet and used for communication between individuals close to each other. Each of them has a different voice like we do. So all of their little noises will be a little different. One of their most unusual is called geckering. It's a guttural chattering that has occasional yelps and howls. Uh, it's heard among adults in aggressive encounters, uh, of which there are very many because foxes are highly territorial. And when the kids are playing or fighting, uh, they will do that. There's also an alarm call, which up close sounds like a cough but from afar, it sounds like a sharp bark, and it's mostly used by fox parents to alert their youngsters to danger. Uh, so a common report that deep gets often involves sounds by, made by red foxes. It's usually like a raspy single syllable scream or bark that's repeated every three to 10 seconds. So that gives you a marker if you wanna to try to guess what animal it is. 
So anyway, uh, get ready if you're sleeping, you might jump. Here's some uh, fox noises. Here's another one. That's the yipping, and here's their geckering. Bet you didn't know they made all these noises, huh? And these are just a few of 40, so. Sorry. It gets off to the far right. It's scent marking. You'll see it stoop a little bit. Okay, so that's one of the ways they scent mark. So anyway, the red red fox is um. Uh, native to Europe and Asia, but its origin in North America, as I said, has been disputed. Um, some scientists are pretty sure that we did have red fox here, uh, but the, a lot of people insist that it was brought here from Europe. Uh, the English did bring them over here to the Southeastern and New England regions for what would uh, fox hunting. Geographically, as I said, it has the widest range of any of the 280 animals in the order carnivora. Uh, while its natural habitat's a mixed landscape of scrub and woodland, its diet allows it to adapt to many environments. As a result, uh, its range is the entire northern hemisphere, again, from the Arctic Circle to North Africa to Central America to the Asiatic steppes. It's even in Australia, but there it's considered an invasive species. Connecticut, as I said, uh, the red fox is, again, the most widespread and very healthy. You can see there in the green where, where it is in North America. Uh, the red fox is a call like Jack the River is roaming the streets. Hey, again, the red fox uh, has, has that call. You heard like a, a Jack the Ripper. Uh, occasionally, somebody thinks that somebody is being distressed or attacked and called. Police. Uh, this is uh, these are two red foxes that I saw in my yard one winter. Uh, that one has frost in its mouth on the top left there, and you can see the very distinct black legs there. Uh, my friend Carl Walsh, who now lives in Maine, he grew up in South Windsor. He allows me to use some of his photos. He got fantastic photos of the Stellar's eagle when it went up to Maine, and lets me use that in my eagles talk. Uh, anyway, red fox is one of nature's loveliest and most elegant creatures. Uh, when they walk along, if they're not chasing anything, they have that little fox trot. And to me, it seems like they're going in and out of air currents, sort of. And I want to find some, you know, uh, symphony music to put to their <laughs> to their little trot. Uh, their red coats do set them apart from many fur-bearing animals, uh, but they're not always red. There is a silver fox, which is a black phase of the red and the cross fox, which is a red fox with dark fur in the shape of a cross down the back and across the shoulders. We typically do not have those here. Again, they are stealth hunters. Uh, when possible, they will stalk their prey and either pounce on it or run it down with a quick burst of speed. Um, they can run up to 30 miles per hour for several miles. They can leap obstacles up to six feet in height and easily swim across rivers and streams. Uh, they can partly retract their claws, which permit it to stalk quietly. And that also helps keep their claws stay sharp, uh, which aids in pinning down their prey. Uh, they also will prey on anything they can catch and kill. Uh, well, 30 miles is faster than we run, so, but they're not coming after us, don't worry. Uh, anyway, uh, they will leap a distance or travel down a stream to put distance between it and something chasing it. Um, here, not much will chase them, possibly a coyote, but out west, of course, mountain lions, uh, wolves will certainly prey on fox. 
So here's the gray fox. I'll let you have your stab at pronouncing that Latin word. Uh, <laughs> that's why I write it up there. Anyway, this is the kingdom, phylum, class, and order, and family therein, and also the red fox. A friend of mine, Jen Ensign, got that pretty photo of a red uh, of a gray fox in winter. And uh, here we've got an old uh, uh, engraving of one. Again, this is the young man from out in California. Uh, the gray fox does have a similar range to the red. It does tend to avoid areas that have cold weather, even though it does have a fairly healthy population in Connecticut. It will inhabit areas of habitat that the red fox avoids. Uh, it does prefer wooded areas because it can climb trees, obviously. It's not found in the plain states or in the western mountain states of the U.S. Uh, it's sometimes obviously called a tree fox. Uh, and it will climb up a leaning tree to take a nap in the lower branches. Uh, and again, they might eat eggs out of nests or nestlings even. Uh, they will climb trees to escape predators. It's a very good way to keep themselves safe. Uh, they'll climb onto a leafy branch and flatten themselves to avoid detection. And as you see, their fur would make them on a lot of our trees are kind of gray. You know, they would camouflage. Um, they're less likely to live or be around humans, uh, and so less likely to be seen. They are around more at night, not out in the day as much as a red fox. But guess what? This little fox is the best fighter of the fox clan. It will stand up to a single dog and easily drive it away, so pretty ferocious in the fighting uh, ring there. Uh, foxes can carry organisms that are responsible for several contagious diseases, such as mange up on the top right, distemper and rabies down on the left. Um, sarcotopic mange is sometimes deadly to foxes and coyotes. It's caused by a microscopic mite that lives in their skin, and animals with mange will lose their hair, they'll lose weight, uh, their skin will come cracked and encrusted with heavy scabs. <clears throat> they'll usually die from the affliction within two to four months. Uh, humans can catch mange uh, from infested foxes, coyotes, or dogs, but the disease is less intense in us. We probably have pills for it, and uh, it's mostly like a mild form of dermatitis. Uh, raccoon rabies is the most common strain of rabies found in Connecticut. There are foxes uh, that have gotten rabies, and generally any fox that has attacked a person has been found rabid. Uh, raccoons are the primary carrier, but foxes also can be infected. Um, most red foxes die from rabies too quickly to spread the disease to other animals or humans uh, because they are a small animal. Nevertheless, animals that appear sick or acting abnormally should be avoided and reported. Uh, rabies, sometimes they'll be frothing at the mouth, walking like a drunk person, you know, just generally sick looking. Mange is pretty easy to detect. Um, the following symptoms may indicate the presence of rabies, uh, like unprovoked aggression, impaired movement, paralysis, lack of coordination, unusually bold behavior, and disorientation. Uh, if you see an animal, any animal that's acting like that, uh, you should call your animal control officer and the police. Uh, if you can't contact local authorities, uh, you can call Deep's 24-hour dispatch center, which I think I have somewhere else on the on here. But it's a good number to write down if you have a pen. It's 860-424-2444. Uh, and again, I think I have it later in, in this presentation. Yeah, there it is. Uh, problems you can't solve, call Deep's 24-hour dispatch center. This was just like a young fox hanging out in some kind of a industrial yard, just uh, taking it easy. I think it was, I took that, it was the summer and it was kind of hot. Uh, living with foxes. Foxes commonly live in close association with human residences and communities where they can find plenty of water, food, and cover. Uh, they frequently inhabit yards, parks, golf courses. I always thought if I was an animal, I'd hang out at a golf course because then I couldn't get shot, but they do use fertilizer there. Uh, it's sparsely areas that adjoin suitable undeveloped habitat. Uh, they do sometimes become accustomed to human act activity, but they're sel seldom aggressive towards people. Um, there have been some problems associated with foxes. Uh, some of those problems are depredation on domestic animals, 
uh, perceptions of danger to humans. Uh, healthy foxes basically pose no danger to humans and also their potential to carry disease organisms. Uh, the mere presence of one doesn't mean you need to see it's a problem and call, uh, but if you are uncomfortable with the presence of foxes or any other animals, here's some things you can do. Don't allow your pets to run free. I've probably told you this before. Keep your cats indoors. They kill millions of birds a year, uh, particularly at night and small dogs on a leash and under close supervision at all times. Uh, these predators, they probably have plenty to eat, so they're probably not going to want to eat your domestic animal, but they don't know it's your pet. They think it's some other uh, fair game prey. So it's incumbent on people who own animals uh, to know if you have wild animals around, and if you do, please be out with them. Never feed foxes. I was at a the Riverton Fair. I, I, you know, do some tables with wildlife stuff and one woman came up to me and bragged about how she gets uh, six raccoons every day to come right up and eat out of her hand. And then I said, do you have kids? And she said, yeah, four. I said, well, do you know that rabies, uh, raccoons are a big vector of rabies and <laughs> you could be bringing an animal that could ultimately be rabid. She was kind of nervous, but I doubt she stopped feeding. But anyway, don't put food out for foxes or any mammals, feed, pet, feed your pets indoors. You heard about the sense of smell of a fox, a fox, a coyote, a bear. If you feed your dog on your deck and leave that empty dish out there, they can smell that from miles away and they come thinking it's food. Uh, clean up any fruit that drops from trees because fox and coyotes both love uh, uh, apples and other fruits and most animals do. Uh, keep the bird seed cleaned up below the feeders. That's just a health thing too. Secure your garbage in animal-proof containers and try not to bring it out if you have garbage pickup until the morning of pickup. That doesn't ensure that it's not gonna get raided, but it cuts your, your chances a lot. Uh, feeding, whether direct or indirect, uh, can uh, act, cause foxes to act tame and it could lead to bold behavior. If an animal gets habituated to food, then they come to your door expecting it if you're not there. So then that's when they might break a screen or you know, break into a shed. Um, if you really want to keep animals out, close off crawl spaces under decks and sheds. Uh, foxes will use these areas for resting and raising young. You have to protect your livestock. You know, hot wire, electric fencing is a great protection. Uh, foxes will prey on small livestock, ducks, chickens, rabbits, young lambs. Uh, generally don't bother large livestock. Uh, secure pens, coops, and fencing can help protect them. Uh, and make sure the enclosures prevent entry from above and below. Uh, foxes will dig. They can squeeze in, you know, through uh, poorly maintained fences and climb over small fences. Um, one way you can protect your chicken uh, coop uh, is to put wire six inches deep and then make a little curtain going out away from the fence and that helps uh, deter digging. Um, most predation does occur at night, so it's important to provide protection at that time. Of course, you know, in your chicken coops, if if they're open to the top, you're also going to have predation by uh, flying things like hawks. Uh, but uh, there are electric fence designs out there that do pr provide protection and are usually species specific. Uh, Deep does have some of that on their website. You can use frightening techniques. Uh, Human presence oftentimes is a deterrence to foxes, uh, but foxes that regularly travel into residential yards get used to it, and let, but they can be scared by being harassed, scared with loud noise, sometimes bright lights, although most animals here are getting used to ring cameras and all of those. Uh, somebody told me spray them with a water hose, but I haven't seen any animal run from that. But anyway, uh, disturbing a den site physically, uh, with unnatural odors during spring may prompt foxes to move to another den, which may be further away. Um, you can use what I use for most wild animals if I don't want them around, which is usually never because I just watch them, you know, <laughs> go through my yard to the woods, uh, is a metal can I call my bear scare can. And you can put either screws or coins in it and shake it. That's not a noise that, uh, that these animals hear. An air horn sounds kind of like a car horn and they get used to that, but shaking 
that bear scare can or, you know, pounding on pans with a metal spoon, that's not a natural noise and usually scares them away. Uh, foxes are classified, classified as fur bear species. So Connecticut does have regulated hunting and trapping seasons. Um, it, it can be used to regulate fox populations while providing recreational opportunities for sportsmen and women. Uh, nationally, millions of dollars are generated every year, believe it or not, from fox pelt harvest. Uh, their thick, dense fur is uh, very valued, particularly overseas in Asian countries in Russia. Uh, live trapping and relocating fox is not recommended uh, uh, because, uh, you know, it's a wild animal. So uh, removing problem foxes is only recommended during designated seasons or if you have a problem. And again, you should call your animal control officer or DEEP if you really have a situation that you need, think you, needs to be controlled. So that's what I've got on foxes and I'll come back to you and I will be happy to answer any questions. Hold on. Um, okay. Oh, that was great. So Thanks. lots to learn there about foxes from you, Jenny. Let me see if I can get back to you. Hold on. Okay. Well, okay. I've so, only done this a million times and I always forget how I do so it. So if you have questions, please put them in the chat box and we will ask Jenny. Um, Jenny, we do have a question. Are foxes and coyotes, or coyote, friends or foes? Survival of the fittest, or survival of the strongest, they're asking. Uh, so are foxes and coyotes friends or foes? Uh, well, they're not friends. They're, and so, you know, foes may, may or may not be, you know, a strong word, but they do compete for uh, food sources. And uh, they do compete for territory. So as I said, the fox will try to stay outside the coyotes territory. Will they pass like shifts in the night sometimes? Uh, and unless there's no food availability, generally they won't bother each other. Um, so they just kind of coexist. Um, but if a fox tried to take a food source or a food area away from a coyote, then they wouldn't tolerate that. Okay. Um, so a question are, um, is there one area of Connecticut that has more fox than others? You know, uh, fox, fox are one of our species that's pretty widespread throughout the state, like coyotes and bobcats, uh, for, you know, major animals. Uh, so there aren't, like fisher, there are pockets of fisher that move somewhat, but but they're not overspread on the state. The porcupines are mostly in Northwest Connecticut, but fox are generally all over the state. Okay, well, that's good to know. And here's a question from Robin. Is there a reason for foxes to have black legs? Why do they have black legs? You know, Robin, I said, I always get a question I'm not sure about. And so I won't try to make something up, but I would have, it has to have, to do with some kind of camouflaging, uh, but I don't know for certain, but I will get that answer and I'll put it in my next Fox talk. Thank you. Um, okay, let me see if there are any other questions here. Uh, Barbara says, thank you, Jenny. I love the graphics and photos. You made this a very interesting presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you. And we'll see you next month. Thanks right. for coming out, everybody.